Today we are doing my September wrap up. I had a great reading month in September and I'm honestly gonna say it's because it was Battle-a-thon which was a month-long readathon created by Mel Nor Reads and I was a co-host for it. It was such an awesome idea, an epic idea. I can't wait to see how it evolves from what it was this year to what it becomes next year. I'm really just excited for it next year. It can stay the same and I'd be perfectly happy because I had such a good reading month in my opinion. There were some highs and some lows, but like for me that's quite normal and I feel like I had more highs than I normally do. So Mel was onto something trying to make us read those five star predictions. I read a total of 15 books in September. My total pages read was 7,259 pages. That ends up being around 242 pages a day. Unsurprisingly, my most read genre was fantasy, most months it is, and I had three five stars, three four stars, six three stars, three two stars, but I had zero one stars, and that is incredible for me. I'll take that any day. So the first book of the month that I read was Master of the Void by Wend Raven. This was a four star for me. This was one of the books I had to read for my semi-finalists for Spiffbo. If you don't know, I'm a judge in Spiffbo 9 this year. There's a bunch of videos on my channel about it, a whole playlist about it you can go check out if you want more explanations on that, but I had to read five semi-finalists in order to pick my finalist to move on in the competition. I picked Master of the Void. I had so much fun with this story. This is a coming-of-age fantasy. We're following a world where everyone is born with magic, but what happens if you're void of it? And we follow two characters who are void of magic, and we follow what this means for them within this world and as they come to terms with that, and we just follow them kind of grow up throughout this world. I just thought this was such an interesting magic system. It's like magic of the stars. I really liked the idea that everybody had magic, and often we're seeing the chosen one, the one strongest with magic, things like that, so I really liked the turn of that usual chosen one trope to having this guy be void of it and I thought that that was really interesting and a really unique take. I love the cover of this book. It's so cool. I'm gonna not really go into that much detail, but I really, really adored the characters in this. I enjoyed the story so much. I'm excited to see what my fellow judges end up thinking of it. Bye, a chunky boy! The next read of the month was The Fires of Time, another Spiffbo semi-finalist read for me. This one sadly wasn't pushed forward, however I still had a fun time with it. I would definitely recommend the audiobook. I give this one three stars. It definitely isn't my personal taste in story, however I think it was really well written. I, I really enjoyed this book for what it is, but what it is isn't a book for me if that makes sense. This reminds me of a cozier fairy tale esque story. No, it's not a fairy tale and it's not necessarily like dark things don't happen, but it just had a vibe of those things. We really followed our character as she explored the world in this and I wanted just a little bit more plot. However, I think people who like less of a hard magic world than I do will really enjoy this because yeah. And when I say fairy tale vibes, the big bad is called the Wooden King. Like does that not give you a fairy tale vibe? Because it does for me. We're following a young girl in this world, Kaya, who was kidnapped when she was quite young and is now forced to live inside the city. She learns from her kidnapper all about magic and the world, but as she does this she's trying to escape, but the city is literally against her and the city refuses to let her leave. And then I read A Sword of Mercy and Wrath for, again, a Spiffbo semi-finalist pick. I give this one three stars. This is a grim and dark fantasy. I did really appreciate this book for what it brings to grimdark. I think in a lot of grimdark books we see darkness and traumatic experience just for shock value and I did feel like anything that happened within this story was meant to showcase the darkness of the world or progress the character. It never felt like it was just jammed down my throat to make me feel disturbed and gross just for shock value. However, I didn't really love this book. I felt like it was too short. I wanted a little bit more character development because I didn't really care about the characters so I didn't really care what happened to them which really affected my view on the world and the darkness and things like that, but I was given this to be a semi-finalist because it really worked for two other reviewers in my batch. Maybe feel like Grimdark a little bit more than me. I used to think I liked Grimdark, but I'm realizing more and more that I like dark fantasy but not necessarily Grimdark, and this just wasn't it for me. I did still give it three stars. I still think it was well written. I had a good time with it, just not a new favorite of mine for sure. And then I read The Blood of the Lion by C.D. McKenna. I really enjoyed this one. I gave it a three stars, but like a higher three stars. I had a fun time with it. This is the first book in like a nine book epic fantasy series. Think Wheel of Time, Stormlight Archive, things like that. Like those epic sprawling stories. And this definitely felt like a setup book. So I think that's what kind of like hindered my enjoyment in some ways, just because setup books don't naturally work for me just because of the reader I am. However, this has me so intrigued to continue. Book two is already out. So I 
need to get my hands on it and read book two because this definitely is a series that I plan on continuing. We're following three characters within this world. It's definitely a darker leaning fantasy world. We're following Mirai who is the king that is cursed with a demon inside of him and makes him do bad things. Then we're also following Cyrus who is the first dragon rider in a long long time and we're following what that means for Cyrus as well as his dragon. Definitely has a bit of boy in your dragon vibes within his POVs but I really enjoyed them. There's a really cool plot line happening within his POV that I was really interested in and then we also follow Sira who has found the demon killer which is a sword that was responsible for a massacre and having people have its hands on it would not be very good so Sira's like kind of protecting it as she goes along. I am really excited to see where this book goes. I think it was really interesting to follow all three of these characters as they experience the world. I'm interested to see how all these three POVs eventually like link up together and I'm really excited to see where the story goes. This was a amazing first book of the series. The next book I read was Mother of Death and Dawn by Carissa Broadbent. This is the last and final book in the War of Lost Hearts series. Sadly this was a series that was just a bust for me. I didn't really like the series from the beginning and it just kind of went downhill from there. This was actually my favorite within the trilogy because I liked the epicness of it. However, I think a lot of the things that we wanted to see accomplished didn't happen in this. This was read for Fan Row Book Club, which is a book club hosted by my friend Sahar, and thank you so much for asking me to be a part of this book club as we read the War of Lost Hearts series. It was a really interesting discussion because we always had differing opinions on where our love of the stories were, but we always agreed on like the flaws and the positives of the story, and I thought that was really fascinating to hear. This series follows our main character, Tasana, who is a slave at the beginning of the series, and she ends up doing something that she's not supposed to do, and in order to save herself, she has to join the order. In order to escape the slavery she's in, she ends up putting herself in a different kind of slavery, and we see the world and stuff expand from there. I just think that there were things not well done in this series. I never connected to the characters in this. There is a fantasy romance story that happens within this story, although I would not call this series fantasy romance at its heart but there is like a romance plot in there. I just never connected to those two. I thought they were boring. I didn't see their chemistry and I think that made a big difference. I would say if you read book one and you loved the love interest, continue on the series. You'll probably have a really good time with the series. If you're like me and you struggled in book one to connect to the romance, you probably will continue to struggle to connect to the romance. So I would probably just DNF it there. This was really disappointing to me after loving The Serpent in the Wings of Night by her. It does continue my pattern of when an author has two series, I love one and I really dislike the other. So these just things are just what they are and I really should unhaul this series but I love the cover so much that I probably won't. And then we read Grey Sister for Backlist Book Club, which is my book club. This is the second book in the Book of the Ancestor series. I reread for me and another five star on reread. This was the only book in the series that I gave five star the first time. I have been loving the series even more on reread. This series follows Nona Grey, who's sent to Sweet Mercy, which is a convent for assassin nuns, and we see Nona just go through life there and struggle with whether she is or isn't the chosen one, as well as we follow a plot line about the world where the ice is slowly creeping more and more and more, and there's only so much land left for people to live on and there is a war happening about this land. I love this series so freaking much. I'm so excited to read Holy Sister this month with Backless Book Club. I can't wait. That's all I gotta say. If you haven't read Book the Ancestor, please pick it up, especially because Backless Book Club probably will be continuing on with the Book of the Ice series after Book the Ancestor. Now these can be read separately. They do not have to be read together. I would recommend reading Book of the Ancestor first though. And then I read The Hawkling by Rebecca Zahabi. This is the sequel to The Colorbound. I read The Colorbound earlier this year in January for book two bestie Johan. Library of a Viking gave it to me to read. It was one of his worst books of the year and I ended up giving it five stars and absolutely loving it. I think I felt how he felt about The Colorbound about The Hawkling. A lot of the complaints about The Colorbound is that it is no plot, it's just vibes. And I didn't mind that in book one, but in book two, I really, really wanted more plot. Like I was bored by the lack of plot we were getting and just like the repeat of what we got in book one. I ended up giving the Hawkling two stars, which was really disappointing to me considering how much I loved the Collarbound, but I was insanely bored by it. And I feel like I didn't really get a lot of new information that progressed the plot forward in it, which is something I really look for in books. I will still be reading the third book in this trilogy when it comes out because I need to know I'm a completionist. 
but it definitely won't be a new favorite series for me. And then I read Jade Legacy by Fonda Lee. I took the dust jackets off because I just like love the black and the color of these and I hate the shiny dust jackets. I, I have such mixed feelings about this series. I read Jade City back last year and Jade War. I gave Jade City a low four stars and then I gave Jade War a low three and I was expecting it to continue to go down. I was expecting a three or a two out of Jade Legacy. I ended up giving this the highest score out of the whole series. I gave it a four star and now I really appreciate Jade City and Jade War for what they were because I thought this was an incredible, incredible conclusion. I bawled my eyes out. I bawled for like literally half a day, I think. Like as I was reading this, I read like probably 400 pages of this in one day and I just bawled every like 20 minutes. And then, you know, you know, if you know, you know. And um, I'm a Jade, I'm a Green Pwn Saga stan now because I just love, love Hilo so much with all of my entire heart. And I, I'm sorry to everyone that watched me read Jade War. And heard my thoughts on Jade War because I still I mean I still stand by that I think that's the weakest book in the series which is most people's favorites but I found it incredibly boring but this was incredible amazing chef's kiss if you haven't read the Green Bone Saga you definitely should after that I read the Bone Shard War which is the final book of the drowning trilogy I gave this two stars honestly it probably should be a one star looking back on it I am severely disappointed in the series I really really loved the first book and then it just went downhill for me from there I did not like the second I really did not like the third and that's just really disappointing because I feel like I really really loved the first and thought it was one of the coolest magic systems and so cool and I think that was kind of part of my problem is I feel like the things I liked about the first book were like the bone shard magic system and like the mystery around the one POV and that all doesn't really matter in the second or the third books in my opinion and I just didn't appreciate the rest of them it it goes on a more epic scope than I think what I wanted and if you liked the second book you probably will like the third book but if you're like me and you didn't like the second book you won't like the third book in my opinion the first book in the series follows a world where we have a magic system that's revolved around bone shards what this is is the emperor can use this magic system they can use this bone magic they can take out a bone shard out of a person and then put it to use making constructs and their constructs will like suck the life essence out of the person that that bone chart is from like shortening their life in order to like make this construct have a life I thought that was really cool and there's like also like a mystery going on the islands are also really unique and cool and like there's a lot going on there's an animal companion I really enjoyed the first book but not the third we're just gonna move on from that pretend it didn't exist and then I read Empire of Sand by Tasha Suri I didn't love this one <laughs> I ended up giving it three stars. It was all right. I just really struggled to connect to the romance in this. Everyone tells me this is a fantasy romance and I think having those expectations didn't really work for me because I did not care about the romance at all. I do think that this romance reminds me of the romance in the War of Lost Hearts series so if you like one you might like the other. It's just two characters who have dealt with a lot of trauma and they're bonding over it. They kind of like heal each other and it's a very soft and subtle romance and that's something that doesn't work for me. I typically like in my fantasy romance a lot of fire characters who are going at each other, cracking jokes, like there's a lot of banter. I don't really like this like soft coddling relationship. It's something I don't want in real life either so I think that that kind of like showcases in the types of stories that I pick up. This plot did start out really cool but it just kind of fell from there because I think you are supposed to be very invested in the romance and I just wasn't. We're following this world, our main character who is half Amrithi. And in this world the Amrithi blood is a death sentence essentially. The king hates Amrithis and he is tracking them down to get rid of them all. But because she is a nobleman's daughter he kind of hides her from the king until one day something happens and the king notices her and the story kind of starts from there with this king being this big bad and our main character having to go marry someone for the king and kind of do his bidding. I felt like the king was supposed to be this really cool epic big bad at the beginning of the story and then when I met him I cared so little about him like he was just like that stereotypical like really evil character that had no depth to him and nothing else other than like hi I'm evil so yeah I didn't really enjoy that this story it probably should have been a two I don't know if I deserve a three and then I read the Emperor's Blades which I gave four stars this was the start of a journey that I am so happy I went on this was so good 
I gave this book four stars because I didn't love the female representation in this and I couldn't really connect to the characters completely. In this, our females are described as what they look like quite often. They have big wonkers, they are very curvy. We get, you know, like, like they're just described like that. We are in the POV of two teenage boys though. That is kind of my biggest complaint about this. I felt like the female characters existed in this book just for the men and not necessarily like for themselves and for their own storyline. I will say that later in this pile you will see the rest of the series though and I really do a hard change of my mind eventually. So just keep watching and you'll you'll understand. This is a story following three siblings. We are following the two sons and the daughter of the emperor. When the emperor is murdered, his kids have to figure out who did it and like the scheme that's going on. However, they are all on different sides of the planet as they've been put on a different life path by their dad. We have one who's in the military, one who is off at a convent being a priest, and then we have one who stayed with the emperor and is like learning politics and stuff. This was a really interesting story I think to see such the broad scope of the world with how the POVs were set up. However, I would also say that this really follows the military which is called the Ketrel. There are these like cool birds also called the Ketrel, which was kind of annoying that like the military is called the Ketrel and the birds are also called the Ketrel. We mostly follow that POV. However, that was my favorite POV throughout the, the series for the siblings and I really loved the military. I do wish that we had learned a little bit more about the birds in it, but I really did enjoy this first book and I thought it was a really, really awesome start to a series. And then I picked up Immortal Longings by Chloe Gong, which was a five-star prediction for me and didn't end so well. I ended up giving this two stars. <laughs> I didn't like it. This book fell so flat for me. So, so flat. I'm very happy for anyone who did enjoy it. If I'm ever interested in another series by Chloe Gong, I'll definitely pick it up, but I don't think I'm gonna go out of my way to pick up her series that are already out after reading this. I wanted this to be The Hunger Games reimagined. I wanted it to be a dystopian and have like such interesting conversations on the world and humanity and things like that. And I just think this never dived deep enough into those things. Even with it being an Antony and Cleopatra retelling, I wanted it to then talk more about obsession because when I did my research, Antony and Cleopatra were like obsessed with each other. And so I was like, okay, cool. We're gonna get like this plot line about obsessing and how obsession works and, and like the like high stakes of obsession and I don't think we got that. I, I didn't even know, realize that they were obsessed with each other in this. Like that that never came across to me. Mostly I just think the characters fell flat. They existed. They had no personality. None of them. At all. Like at all. But I did like the magic system in this. In this story we're following a world that is a dystopian world. It's not great and the king is worried about someone coming to kill him so he hides in his castle. But once a year, he holds the games, which is across the city. The city has it has walls up. And across the city, we have a hundred people who participate. They volunteer. The goal is to be the last one standing. So you have to kill everyone else off. There is a magic system in this about like switching bodies, which was kind of cool. We follow our main character who wants to kill the king. And in order to get close to the king, because he doesn't come out of his palace, the only time he comes out of his palace is to like grant the victor the winning title. She has to be the victor in these games and we follow her as she enters the games. I wanted the games to be cooler. I wanted them to be a bigger part of the story. I wanted the magic system to even be better at times, although I did like it. I don't know. I just, I didn't love this. And then I picked up The Providence of Fire. The second book in the Chronicles of the Unhewn Throne. I loved it. Five stars. Chef's Kiss. Incredible, 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 incredible second book. Everything I complained about in book one doesn't exist. The females in this, amazing. They never described in this how they look, and I think that that is a sign of an author growing and listening to some critiques, as well as a sign of our characters growing, because the boys in this are no longer just like living their high school lives. They've got bigger stuff to deal with than just like looking at a female's wonkers and being like, man, those are some big wonkers. I really appreciated that. And then I also just think the females had their own storyline and their own arcs. We get a new POV in this, who I absolutely adored, Gwenna. Gwenna, 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 Gwenna. Gwenna is incredible, amazing, chef's kiss. I love Gwenna. And we really just saw the world expand so much within this story. It becomes bigger than just the emperor's deaths and how the kids are gonna react. It is like gods being involved in things. And like, it just grows so, exponentially that like I have no words but I words 
I have no words, 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 words. Why does that word sound funny now? I don't know what to say other than this was like an incredible second book. I did not think that we could top this after this because this was so good. I was so invested in the journey so so dang invested and after that i picked up the witch collector by sharisa weeks for a little fantasy romance i had heard really good things about this story and so i decided to pick it up we're following a town where the witch collector comes like every season to pick up a girl to then bring to the frost king they don't really know why he does this but we know that he collects witches because they all have magical abilities we follow our main character who hates the witch collector because the witch collector took her sister and refuses to take her. She wants to save her sister, but how can she do so if the witch collector doesn't take her? We then have a problem. But then something happens and the witch collector and this girl are forced to be around each other and things expand from there. I felt like this romance was really boring. Again, just I think an MC for a fantasy romance that I don't necessarily love. She was very much just like, go with the flow or like just accepting answers and I just want a little bit more fire to my MCs. I just want just a little more angst and some tension. I don't want it to be so like forgiving so early on. I really like an enemies to lovers and I felt like this, although yes she hated him enemies to lovers, the reason they were enemies was resolved so quickly like in the first like 50 pages. Probably not even that. Probably like the first 15 pages. They like kind of even count as enemies to lovers because they're on the same side. And yeah, um, the miscommunication was just too easily communicated for me. I needed to stretch out a lot longer. So I just didn't have a fun time with this. However, I do think it was well written. There was a lot of plot to it. I enjoyed the plot enough, but it's not a series that I will be continuing as I was mostly just bored in it. But I do think a lot of people will like this. Again, I think just not my typical type of love story. It is very like wintry though. So this is a good book for winter. And then my very last book of the month, I ended on such great terms, was The Last Mortal Bond, which is the third and final book in the Chronicles of Unhewn Throne series by Brian Stavely. Five stars to this, like absolutely no doubt about it, five stars. Chef's Kiss. People say that this is the weakest book in the series, like so many people on Goodreads, however it was my favorite. And I kind of get why. I get that the ending is rushed. Like, I do think the ending of, like, the big bad was rushed. However, it also felt like it made sense to me. And I didn't really care because I was just in it for the characters. Like, I could have followed these characters for another nine books easily and never gotten bored. I felt like this world was so expansive, too. I know a lot of people complained about not having answers to everything. However, I know that this world continues on in, in other books. There is a standalone called Skullsworn. And then a whole second series called The ashes of unhewn throne so i'm expecting more answers within these and i didn't need those answers in this book because like there were open-ended things but like i'm excited that i then can figure that out in future books in the future world where like i do feel like the story we followed of the three siblings was wrapped up very well and i really enjoyed just following these three siblings they broke my heart at times they were stupid but like i also understood all of the reasonings that they were making i just really really loved this series it is one of my new all-time favorite series like i can tell you right now when i make an updated favorite list next year because i made one in april this will be on it because this was an incredible series so expansive so unique in my opinion I need more books with birds. I love giant birds apparently because I loved A Touch of Light with the Griffins. I loved this with the Ketrel. And I also really liked Fonda Lee's novel this year, Untethered Sky, which also had rooks in it. And I, I just really enjoy apparently giant birds. That is my wrap up for September. I read a lot of amazing books. I started doing seasonally wrap ups, but I felt like September was just an odd month for me because it doesn't really fit into my spooky season plans at all. So... I decided to give it its own wrap-up. Honestly, I just have no idea what I'm ever doing with wrap-ups. I can never agree on what I'm doing with wrap-ups. So I decided to film a wrap-up just for September this month. You get it. I might decide to do that again for October, or you might get an October, November, or you might get like an end of year wrap-up. I just never know what I'm doing. I can never decide. Wrap-ups are a struggle for me. <laughs> However, I hope you enjoyed this one. And if you made it all the way to the end of this video, you can let me know what your least favorite book of September is because in my last September vlog, I asked for your favorite book. And then if you'd like to just leave me an emoji to say you were here, leave me like an award emoji, like a trophy or like, you know, like the ribbon with like the medal because my team did come in first in Battleathon, So I think it was just needed. Also, I just had like such a great reading month. So I feel like I deserve a reward for that. And then if you'd like to connect with me on other platforms, my bookstagram, my book, Twitter, my Goodreads, and my Patreon are all linked in the description bar below. Have yourselves an absolutely incredible day.